On July 11, 1804, famed American statesmen Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr infamously met in Weehawken, New Jersey for a duel. According to some historians, Hamilton, whose son had died dueling in this very spot three years prior, had hoped to avoid bloodshed by purposefully firing a shot that would miss his opponent. Burr, however, did not have the same intentions, and Hamilton was fatally shot in the stomach. Dueling had long been considered an affair of honor, a practice originating in medieval Europe that eventually emigrated with settlers to the American colonies. The rules were simple. Two men stood several paces across from each other, and one at a time, each fired upon their opponent. This continued until either the men felt as if their honor had been satisfied, or like Hamilton, one lay dead. In spite of laws forbidding the violent practice, dueling continued well into the 19th century. And in the South, where men often felt their honor was as important as life itself, dueling was far more common. Many of these conflicts were resolved without bloodshed, but far too often they proved fatal, leaving families to grieve for the beloved. It is for this very reason that some claim the spirit of a woman still wanders the Chapel of the Cross Cemetery in Mansdale, Mississippi. A grieving apparition that purportedly continues to mourn the untimely loss of her fiancé, who was shot dead on the field of honor days before the couple were meant to wed. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. John Taylor Johnstone was born on April 28, 1801. He was the son of Samuel Williams Johnstone, North Carolina's Surveyor General, and Sarah Thompson Johnstone. As a young adult, John and his two brothers left North Carolina from Mississippi around 1820 and eventually purchased 2,500 acres of land near the community of Mansdale where he established a number of plantations and farms, earning a fortune in the cotton trade. But once these revenue streams were established, Johnstone returned home to North Carolina, where he married Margaret Thompson and started a family. The couple had four children, daughters Frances and Helen, and sons Samuel and Noah, and for 15 years, Johnstone traveled back and forth between North Carolina and Mississippi, gradually moving supplies, equipment, and his enslaved workforce to his Mississippi plantations. Then, in 1840, after the death of both of their sons, the family permanently relocated to Madison County, Mississippi. Initially, they resided in a spacious log cabin that was named Annandale in honor of the ancestral Scottish lands of the Johnstone family, who once held the title of the Earl of Annandale and Hartfell. Soon enough, though, the wealthy couple began planning for a new home, a grand mansion that was believed to have been patterned after the ancestral family estate in Scotland. However, Prior to this construction, Johnstone gifted 1,400 acres of his land to his daughter Frances 
and her new husband, William Britton. Construction then began on an elegant Italianate-style home for the newlyweds, which they would name Ingleside. This mansion featured a 180-foot wide facade and contained eight bedrooms, dressing rooms, a parlor, library, breakfast room, dining room, and office. Some say that for John Taylor Johnstone, Ingleside was merely practice for the grand new Annandale that he envisioned for his family. However, prior to this construction, his wife Margaret insisted that they first build a chapel. Unfortunately, before construction on this chapel commenced, John Taylor Johnstone died suddenly on April 23, 1848. Although grieved by her husband's death, Margaret Johnstone was not deterred from continuing the plans that she had made with John. After observing the proper period of mourning, which during the 1800s was two years for a widow, Margaret took control of the construction, and in 1850, work began on the chapel. It is said that Margaret oversaw every detail from ensuring the timber was cut to her specifications to seeing that the bricks were made properly, fired correctly in the on-site kiln. She also personally directed the uncrating and installation of the stained glass windows and baptismal font, which had arrived from France, as well as the pews, altar, and pump organ, which was imported from England. Everything was placed according to her specifications. Following the completion and consecration of this Episcopal chapel in 1852, Margaret Johnstone arranged for her husband's remains to be removed from its temporary burial site in the family's flower garden and had him reinterred in the family plot of the chapel's cemetery. But three more years would pass before Margaret Johnstone would begin construction on her and her late husband's vision for the grand Annandale Plantation House. For the design of the mansion, Margaret worked closely with her youngest daughter, Helen, traveling the country in an effort to see and study the current and most popular architectural styles of the day. Ultimately, they rejected the popular Gothic Revival style of architecture that had been used for the Chapel of the Cross, a style frequently found amongst the mansions and plantation homes across the South. Instead, she chose the Italian and architectural style, the same style that had previously been used by her husband in the design of Ingleside. Construction began in mid-1857 and took almost three years to complete, and the result was a three-story tall mansion with a total of 40 rooms. As expected, Annandale exceeded the grandeur, splendor, and elegance of Ingleside. Once completed, Margaret and her daughter Helen moved into the mansion in 1859 and plans began to be made for an immense reception for Helen's upcoming marriage. Unfortunately, tragedy struck the Johnstone family once again and Helen's life would forever change. Helen was the youngest daughter of John and Margaret, born on May 21st, 1839. As a young woman, she was said to be beautiful, with light brown hair and blue-gray eyes. And Helen was only 16 years old when she met the love of her life. It was Christmas time in 1855, 
and construction of Annandale had yet to begin. So Margaret and Helen visited Ingleside for the holiday. Then, as the Britton and Johnstone family were seated for supper, they heard a knock on the door. On the other side, they found a young man splattered in mud, seeking aid from the master of the house. The man's carriage wheel was broken and his rig was bogged down in the mud. So he approached the home seeking aid and freeing and repairing his carriage. William Britton agreed to help and sent men to assist. But in the meantime, the young man was offered a room to stay as a guest at Ingleside until repairs could be completed. This young man was Henry Gray Vick the son of an affluent Mississippi family and great-nephew of Newitt Vick, the founder of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Exactly how long Vick stayed at Ingleside is unknown. Some stories say it was a single day, others that it extended on, but all agree that by the time Henry left the home, he and Helen had fallen in love. Mrs. Johnstone approved of the match, as Vic was from a good family and seemed to be a young man who would make something of himself. But Helen, at barely 16, was too young to marry. So the couple's courtship lasted several years, with Henry frequently visiting the family at Annandale. By 1857, when Helen turned 18 years old, Mrs. Johnstone finally gave the couple permission to marry, but they would have to wait until her daughter turned 20. However, this wedding would never take place. One week prior to the wedding, Henry Vick took what should have been a quick business trip to New Orleans. There, he planned to purchase a wedding suit and several items for the house that he and his bride would live in after they married. Legend claims that before he left on this trip, Henry promised his fiancée that he would avoid the ever-popular tradition of dueling at the slightest of insults to one's honor. Some stories claim that this promise, however, wasn't to not duel, but rather to never kill a man as the result of such an affair. Either way, for Vic, it seemed an easy promise to make, as he had never anticipated to be put in this position. While in New Orleans, Vic stayed at the St. Charles Hotel and successfully acquired his wedding attire and the household items he had gone for. But one evening, he went out for drinks at a tavern or billiard room where he ran into his one-time friend, James Stith. It is said that the pair had quarreled before and that although Vic had moved on, Stith had not. Unsurprisingly, the men began to argue. Exactly what was said is not known, although some sources claim it was a dispute over land. Nevertheless, words were said and tempers flared. Stith slammed his glass down and claimed he could not drink in the same room as Vic, for he was no gentleman. In turn, Vic responded forcefully supposedly going for Stith's throat. Stith retaliated with a punch to Vic's face and the men were quickly separated. But instead of the altercation coming to a close, Vic issued the challenge of a duel. Within several hours, he regretted his decision. After all, he had promised Helen that he would not enter into such a violent ordeal or kill as the result of one. So Vic's friend, Colonel Lockridge, was sent to Stith to explain the circumstances and Vic's regret, hoping that the duel would be called off. 
but Stith refused, claiming that if Vic would not duel, Stith would hound him for the rest of his days, proclaiming him a coward. Thus, it was decided the duel would take place, but not in New Orleans. Instead, Alabama was chosen, and Vic, Stith, and four men accompanying them took the next mailboat out of the city to Mobile. The group had to move fast. Mobile's police had already been made aware of their intentions and wanted to stop and arrest the men before the crime could take place. Unfortunately, they did not. So on May 17, 1859, four days before Vic was supposed to marry Helen in the Chapel of the Cross, he and James Stith stood 30 feet apart in a grove of trees on Scott Street known as Holly's Garden. Both men were armed with a Kentucky long rifle. Vic was known as an excellent marksman, capable of taking down a running deer with a single shot. But on this day, he fired into the air, showing no desire to kill his one-time friend, hoping the matter would be resolved peacefully. But Stith did not care. Henry Vick was killed instantly from a single shot to the head. Stith and his companions quickly escaped the area and journeyed back to New Orleans as Vic's friends lingered to make arrangements with the undertaker. But the men had to be careful as a citywide search was underway for the duel's participants. So the men were forced to take refuge and hide in the home of a doctor. Fortunately, Vic's friend, A.G. Dickinson, got a message to the police chief confessing his role in the duel and requesting that they be allowed to take Vic's body back to Vicksburg. The chief was moved by the man's loyalty to his friend and saw to it that the men were smuggled out of the city with Vic's body. Meanwhile, at Annandale, wedding preparations were still underway. It is said that Helen and her mother were arranging decorations inside the chapel when the telegram arrived. It read, Henry Vick killed today, May 17, in a duel at Mobile, Alabama. We'll bring body to Vicksburg on earliest steamer. Helen was inconsolable. The two families quickly went from the joy of an upcoming wedding to the bottomless mourning of an unexpected death and funeral. Helen pleaded with her beloved's family to be buried near her in the Chapel of the Cross's cemetery, to which they agreed. Then, on the eve of what should have been Helen and Henry's wedding day, the funeral procession arrived. Vic's casket was taken through a torchlit path through Old Mansdale and into the Chapel of the Cross, which had been decorated for his wedding, but would now instead be used for his funeral. Vic was then buried in the Johnstone family plot. His marker, a tall stone, carried a simple inscription. Henry Gray Vic entered into rest May 17, 1859. Helen sunk into grief and depression, prone to immense bouts of hysterical sobbing, and so she spent the majority of the next several months sitting on a wrought iron bench beside Henry's grave. And it was during this time that Helen made her family promise that the space beside Henry's grave would be left open and reserved for her own burial one day. But fearing her daughter would grieve herself to death, 
Mrs. Johnstone took Helen to Scotland to visit her father's family. There, they remained for several months to a year until Helen seemed to have recovered from the loss of her love. Years eventually passed, and in August of 1862, Helen Johnstone was married to another man, a minister and Confederate chaplain named George Harris. Although Helen chose to marry, it is said that she was very clear about the realities of her affections, and that she promised George that she would be a good wife to him, but she would never be able to love him as she had loved Henry Vick. Harris served as a clergyman for the Chapel of the Cross for several years until he took a new post and the couple moved to northern Mississippi where they remained for the rest of their lives. Helen lived to the age of 78 and died on November 19, 1917. But in spite of the promise made decades before, Helen's family ignored her wishes to be buried at the Chapel of the Cross the first love, and instead she was laid to rest beside George Harris at Mound Cemetery in Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Of course, many believe this disregard for Helen's wishes has caused her much unrest and death, fueling a century of stories that claim her spirit still grieves for her beloved. Over the years, visitors to the Chapel of the Cross Cemetery have reported seeing a beautiful young woman dressed in the black of mourning clothes, drifting amongst the graves. The apparition is said to visit Henry Vick's grave and it's been seen reaching down to brush away fallen leaves or to sorrowfully touch the inscription of his name. Those who have seen her claim she sits bowed in grief and purportedly when approached, they're greeted with a startled look before her apparition vanishes before their eyes. In 1971, the prolific folklorist Catherine Tucker Wyndham wrote of the tale in her book, Jeffrey Introduces 13 More Southern Ghosts, claiming the events that occurred over a century prior have become, quote, one of Mississippi's most romantic and most tragic love stories. She wrote, The space beside Henry Vick's grave at the Chapel of the Cross is still vacant but the sorrowing ghost of Helen Johnstone Harris comes there often to brush the fallen leaves from the grave, to run her fingers over the granite letters that spell his name, and to weep. Today, nothing remains of the Grand Annandale Plantation Home that was built by Margaret Johnstone in the 1850s as on the night of September 9th, 1924, Annandale burned to the ground. Yet the Episcopal Chapel of the Cross and adjoining cemetery remain, protected by its designation on the National Register of Historic Places. There, Henry Vick's grave can still be visited, and the plot beside it intended for Helen more than a century ago, is still empty. But if the legend of the Bride of Annandale is to be believed, Helen Johnstone's spirit is there anyway, still grieving the loss of her fiance. My name is Brandon Schecksneider. And you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast. 
Written and produced by Brandon and Brianne Schecksnyder. For special access to members-only content, including access to the series Southern Gothic, The Monsters, as well as updates and links to our social media, visit southerngothicmedia.com today. Lucky Lady Shacks.